This is episode 19 of the Immunology Podcast, Parasitic Infections with Dr. Kiki Fairfax. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rowd. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today we have Dr. Kiki Fairfax from the University of Utah on the podcast to talk about her research using Schistosoma mansoni as a tool to understand IL-4 and immunomodulation and parasitic infection, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM fields. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... We'd like to remind our listeners about Immunology of Infectious Disease News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by Stem Cell Science News covering the latest research, news, jobs, and events in infectious diseases. Immunology of Infectious Disease News helps you stay current with the latest COVID-19, HIV, hepatitis, tuberculosis, influenza, and malaria research. Subscribe at www.immunologyofinfectiousdiseasenews.com. So I'm all fat and happy from Thanksgiving. Are you going anywhere soon? Are you doing anything that lets you get the heck out of, uh, you know, the lab? Well, um, it is first christmas market season in germany at the moment they are the best day for them all of december is christmas and they have this christmas markets we are really really nice well uh, very much recommend so we were planning on going visit the christmas markets in cologne which is kind of the one of the closest cities uh from amsterdam so that was the plan for this weekend but i don't know you know there's no omicron panic setting in and the fact that there's Already a bunch of Omicron positive patients here in the Netherlands. I really hope that the Germans won't decide to just shut us out. Um, so yeah, that's that was my upcoming plan. Yeah, the, the Omicron panic or Omicron, because there's there's a this debate if you pronounce it the British English, it's Omicron, and in okay. American English, it's Omicron, and this is a matter of contention. <laughs> among people currently like all things. Well, we should pronounce it the greek way if you ask me omicron uh, i don't know yeah. is uh it, it's driving me nuts because this is what viruses do they mutate and this one looks like it's mild symptoms and spreads more which is just part of its endemic course so i don't know why we're flipping out like yeah i, I mean we're flipping out because i guess they don't want to repeat what they did with the other variants in which often they I don't know. They once and by now it's too late, I guess. I don't know. The, the government wants to show they're doing something. People are are scared about the, the vaccines not working, which is not a complete crazy thing to think, given the amount of mutations this thing has. So, yeah, it's just it's the unknown, not knowing exactly what we're all, up all against. The cases that they've had in South Africa were mild. Yeah, but t- keep in mind that South Africa is a younger population. Well, they were so all unvaccinated by just statistics, too. it's going to be sorry. What? They're mostly unvaccinated as well, and well, but they have probably already a lot of like pre-existing immunity against the other variants. So I don't know. Yeah, well, my point being, this is just where we're going to end up. Like, there's always going to be a new variant every like. If we yeah. track the flu variants or any other variant of any other virus, we'd see the exact same thing. Yeah, and I'd be much more concerned if there was a spike in death, but there wasn't. There was just—I I mean, I, I agree. It's early, but well, you know, if if it turns out that there's something very sinister about this variant, and we didn't do anything about it when we could-ish, uh, I don't know. We'll see. Time. Yeah. I think now everything is chaos. I think some of the re- data is going to come up regarding serious analysis on the mortality the and the protection from vaccines and we'll see where where that takes us but i don't know on the one hand yeah you want to be uh, you want to be cautious although it's not as it's not the south africa variant is already present in other countries so blocking flights from south africa is probably not gonna make such a huge difference they actually found already two old samples from the netherlands that were sequenced to be uh omicron uh uh, samples so right. it's, it's already here that, and what are we going to do next variant are we always just going to be in permanent lockdown for the rest of our lives yeah that's our future jason that's that's oh. going to be our life lockdown after the other a harsh winter after the next 
No, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope not. But well. like my point being that we're not going to change. No, nothing changes going forward. Like we have vaccines. There will be variants. They'll make Maybe they vaccine. can make a vaccine that also is better against these variants if they find that well, uh, right. but it'll immunization just be part of the is common. Cycle. Just like you get a flu shot every year to yeah. whatever comes out. Yeah. But we don't all no. run and hide while we're waiting for the flu shot. Well, we do need people to get vaccinated. Yes, no, we don't. absolutely. And people don't get vaccinated enough. So. Well, exactly. We need that. I'm just saying we don't necessarily need to uh, flip out every time a variant comes around. No. For the rest of our I lives. I agree. That's Let's what we're be doing concerned, right. but not panic. Yes. Okay. Get your but shots. well, get your shots, people, please. Get your family and friends to get their shots. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure the listeners of this podcast are already vaccinated if they have. I hope so. <laughs> well, do you have a COVID paper you want to share with us to start with, or are we COVID free this week? I actually don't have a COVID paper. I was hoping to see some some like last minute things on Omicron, but not yet. So not I guess quite. next time, folks, I'm sure we'll have something next time. All we right, can well, pretend then, there's no COVID for today. Well, I'll jump into the last viral panic we had, um, which was HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, Fauci version one, as it were, so his original work before this this round. Uh, this paper is titled Delayed Antiviral Therapy in HIV Infected Individuals Leads to Irreversible Depletion of Skin and Mucosa Resonant Memory T Cells. First author is Simona Saluzzo, and the last author is George Sterry. It was published in Immunity on November 22nd. And so this this was interesting. In that, so taking a high level view, people with HIV uh, who are chronically infected have higher risks of all types of cancers, including skin cancers, partially due to loss of immune surveillance. So they lose their helper cells. You can't kill early infected cells that have viruses like HPV um, that dry, go on and drive the virus. So they looked at a cohort, two cohorts of people. The first cohort are those who go on antiviral therapy early like really soon after realizing their infection, the second being those that don't start till much later. All groups were fully reconstituted in this group, so they had their CD4 sounds come back. But they found that that early differentiation, that, that step where you pick oh, you, you, where someone gets the treatment early or not, has profound downstream um, effects. And specifically that if you don't get treated early, you lose a pool of resident T memory cells. So these cells are lost in early HIV infection, and they come back if you go on therapy early, but they don't come back if you go on therapy later or nearly as much. And they sit in the tissue, so they come from the tissue, or they come from the circulation, they find this paper. So they track like where the regeneration of these cells are coming from. They show that they're not just like, born obviously in the skin and stay in the skin they come from the circulation and go there but the virus will eliminate enough of them that their reserve to repopulate is permanently depleted and as a result of losing these t resident memory cells you lose some protection from things like hpv and can thus have less worse cancer later and they show that this is related to cxcr3 expression on the skin and cd8 cells um, and that patients who had therapy later have less of these positive CXCR3 memory cells. So it was really interesting because it shows that early therapy has a lot of impacts. It has decreased these memory cells, decreased cytokine signaling, more migration out of helper cells. And so you have HPV persistence and then cancer risk. So early effects on therapy have profound downstream effects, which is different than I think people have thought. Things like, oh, you go on therapy, you get back to re baseline, but when you start matters. And that, that has profound clinical implications. And so that, that's very interesting. And we have to keep in mind that HIV infects CD4 cells. It is the depletion of CD4 cells that is the problem. Yes, but I believe these T resident, these, these T memory cells are the most abundant subgroup of T helper cells or CD4 T cells. Right. But is um, when it comes to preventing, for example, um, when it comes to mucosal immunology or, or skin immunology and the cells that are going to actually be mediating, for example, protection from uh, 
generate tumor uh, uh, occurrence is going to be mostly CD8 cells. Are they so right? So they don't show up to the party because the memory cells aren't telling them to go kill this thing called HPV over here because they don't have a memory of it anymore because they're all dead. Gosh, talking. I think there's a lot of uh, papers we've been talking about that this is like really long term effects of a one. Um, particular intervention has untold long-term effects, things that you just never get back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, this is crazy. I think the, the example I think of is if I remember right, measles was found to be so deadly yeah. because it wipes out your T memory cells. And so you reset or your B cells, I forget which one it is, but it wipes out your memory immunity. So kids who get it when they used to be so deadly, not because it's a deadly virus, it can be. But it has a secondary, even worse effect of whiting out all the immunity that you developed when you were really young. Yeah. It's re-exposed really sick again. And so in the era before modern medicine, uh, where you could like write out that pneumonia or whatever, you would it'd be particularly bad because you lose all your memory. All, you know, if you survived, you have to go through the gauntlet again. So that shows how important it is. The, yeah, the, the small, like kind of consistent buildup of memory for different pathogens and how difficult it is to get it back once you lose it for well we're seeing reason. immunological debt now so all the kids that are staying home and now going back to school mike's kids out for the third day with a cold right now because he's been in a mask yeah. all the time and now when they get sick they get real sick even when it's yeah. not COVID, they just like they haven't been around the crud for a year or plus and masks and hiding from people and so now when they get it they get it really bad so they're seeing that happening in hospitals a lot for children is uh, immunological debt that we're all paying off. That's great. So we're going to have a COVID, a COVID peak, and then a, all the other diseases also, transmittable diseases are going to peak together. Well, and all the other diseases because people aren't taking care of their other problems. So cancer is spiking right now because people delayed colonoscopies, for instance. Oh, great. Let's move on to something slightly less um, discouraging. Do you have a do you have a T reg cell paper you want to discuss because T regs are your favorite? Well, not a T reg, but it is a T cell paper. Close and enough. I it's a paper that's very close to kind of really up my alley when it comes to research interests. Uh, this paper comes from the group of Sina Hadrup in, at the Technical University of Denmark, published in JCI, Journal of Clinical Investigation. And it's titled Neo Antigen. Reactive CD8 T cells affect clinical outcome of adoptive transfer with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and melanoma. So let's take that apart a little bit. Um, as you know, and I think all of our listeners know, T cells are really good at finding new things and identifying them as foreign and therefore mediating an immune rejection. And that is often the case for cancer. And I think the more that we are uh, tapping into immunotherapies and the more we are evaluating their immune response against tumors, we see that having, being able to teach, to prime the immune system and particularly T cell immunity against tumors can make the whole difference when it comes to um, having a complete response in a patient. So nowadays, thanks to immunotherapy, complete responses are uh, very, can be very impressive in, in certain patients. And melanoma has been a very, uh, much studied tumor because it uh, has a high mutational burden and is characterized often by a lot of T cells that are infiltrating these tumors. And it has been showing very good responses in certain cases like with immunotherapy that activates T cells in, the, in, in these patients. So one of the things that T cells can re recognize on tumors are what are known as neoantigens. These are antigens that are, appear upon mutations on the the, the, uh, the tumors due to their genetic instability or sometimes they're associated with driver mutations that generate the, the transform of phenotype of a, of a tumor cell. And these are very interesting antigens because they're specific for this tumor and by definition, they're not found on healthy cells. And so the thing is often it is hard to evaluate the response against these tumors because against these antigens because yeah, by definition, they're specific for each patient. You, re, you make, need to make reagents that are specific for each patient and that recognize specific to, uh, mutated sequences. So large scale analysis of these responses is often cumbersome. And so there's not a lot of published. Well, there, yeah, I think, but more and more, we were getting more and more of that. 
So in this, in this publication, they took a study in which they treated patients with tumor infiltrating lymphocyte uh, therapy, in which they take the tumor material, they expand the lymphocytes that are there uh, in the assumption that the tills, the, 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 the lymphocytes that are in, in, this, in this digest, they're going to uh, expand and hopefully a bunch of those are going to be tumor specific because they were found in the tumor to start with. And so they took 26 patients that were treated like this. Some of them were complete responders, some of them were not responders and things in between. And what they did, and this is a lot of work, they predicted from the exome sequencing of the tumor, they predicted five, uh, almost 6,000 neoepitopes, so uh, neoantigens using specific uh, bioinformatic uh, 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 yeah, uh, protocols. And they generated uh, what are known as uh, multimers, which are uh, antigen presenting molecules, so our uh, MHC molecules presenting each of these pep each of these predicted peptides and barcoded with DNA. Then they uh, and then they use this to stain till products, so this uh, this this therapeutic products from expanded tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and to identify which of those T cells. So how much of how much how many of these patients had T cells that could recognize this particular peptides in the context of the patient's MHC molecules. And they found, so unsurprisingly, and I think this is not a lot of things that we already kind of assumed, but it's really nice to see this studied in a larger scale and comparing responder to non-responder patients. What do they see that? In fact, those patients that responded to this therapy had an increased proportion of T, of T cells in, their, in the products that they received that were specific against these new epitopes. And that really could uh, pre really correlate it with the, with the clinical uh, prognosis or with the, with the clinical outcome of this patient. And they do a couple of things. So they look into the, the, these T cells, how, how much they can recognize uh, tumor cell lines derived from the, from the tumors of these patients. And they uh, identify um, uh, how they look also throughout treatment whether they can find this T cell specific, so T cell specific against these epitopes in the patient after the infusion or even before the treatment. And they see that patients that have, that often they can find them again in the, in the circulation, these T cells, the T cells that are specific against these new epitopes uh, after the infusion, although they kind of run out after a couple of months, you don't find them as much anymore but that that's enough to mediate tumor regression in, in those patients that respond. Also, interestingly, and this is, I think it's important to understand which patients are going to respond and which are not going to respond to this therapy. They see that patients that responded already had a baseline amount or frequency or, uh, or increased repertoire of T cells recognizing these epitopes already in the tumor material. So patients, it, it does show that patients that respond the best already have a better starting material. And that it's interesting because it's really hard to predict whether a patient will respond or not. But what they show is that epitome, uh, neo neoantigen recognition does correlate with, with, uh, with the response, that patients that respond keep these neoantigen specific T cells for longer, and that often they already have a baseline that is better off but that does not necessarily correlate with the tumor mutational burden in general, but the presence of the T cells are not necessarily what on the tumor side seems to be the, 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 the kind of the definitory uh, characteristic of responding patients. Really nice work. And uh, I think it's a lot of work to generate all of these reagents. So kudos to, to these people. And I think this really opens, gives another uh, reason to continue pushing for targeting this new antigen on, on, on patients, even though it's hard because they're specific for each one. So all these therapies will need to be very personalized. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, the amount of work. So they made 5,000 some odd epitopes. Yeah. They, and then they, they synthesized 5,000 peptides. And then they, they did that with a bunch of different patient samples as well. So, yeah. like, you know, 10, 20 patients? 26. Times 5,000. No, in, in total. So each patient had about three to 500. Oh, okay. Thank God. I thought, I thought. 
no, like, this is the complete. And so from from five, almost so from fifty nine hundred epitopes that they predict. Okay. They find in total about two hundred that are uh, actually they can per find T cells that are. I'm, okay. Okay. In that's general, a little better. So that, that, that was a little better. And do they use robotics or something for this, or they just have some poor? I don't know actually. Trainee with a pipette. I did not see. Uh, it was has, not clarified. Uh, who now has a workplace injury and has to go. <laughs> yeah, some have... tendonitis. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. Well, I'm also going to go JCI here. Um, this paper's first author is Brenda Moinen. Last author is Christopher Love, and it is entitled Peanut Oral Immunotherapy Differentially Suppresses Clonal Distinct Subsets of T Helper Cells. So before I deep dive into this, um, I... I chose this one because I came from a lab that had originally studied oral tolerance way back when, although it kind of moved on from that. Um, but also because I think it's really interesting with peanut allergy. It's actually risen in recent years because of peanut allergies. People were not allowed to eat peanuts at school or elsewhere. So then people were exposed to less and less peanut antigen as children, which made them get more peanut allergies. So now in healthcare, we tell kids to start eating peanut butter, have their moms eat peanut butter while they're breastfeeding, and then eat peanut butter really early so that you don't develop a peanut allergy. So this is really interesting uh, as a phenomenon. So then to jump in, oral immunotherapy is basically a peanut antigen that you eat every day to develop tolerance to it. So it's a brilliant mechanism, you titer it up. Um, you could probably do the same with peanut butter, but you know, A, it's not a defined dose, B, you can't make as much money off of it. So, uh, but it's a similar concept, right, in, in a way. And what they found is that, so what's interesting is that some people have sustained tolerance and some people don't after they come off. Most people, when they're on the therapy, do better. But the whole point is not to have to take this every day, that you develop some permanent tolerance to it. And they're trying to figure out why. So they did single cell RNA sequencing and pair T cell alpha beta receptor sequencing. And looked at a combination of CD154 and CD137 positive not, not dual positive, you don't get dual positives of these, but looking at T helper cells from patients, 12 patients longitudinally who went through this therapy. So they found the therapy in general had expansion of TH1, TH2, and TH17 signatures, not surprising, and that they were six clonally distinct subsets, and that four of the subsets demonstrated convergence across patients on T cell receptor sequencing, suggesting that you had antigen driven fate, right? You have this common antigen being given, you have convergence of some T cells. Okay, nothing crazy there. But what they found that was really interesting is they found um, so during the therapy, you had suppression of TH2 and TH1 in effector clonotypes, but not T cell follicular helper cells. So you had suppression of TH1, and TH2. But most importantly, positive outcomes. So when you were done with it, you had stronger suppression of TH2 cells It with specific TH2A. And treatment failure was associated with expression of baseline. So if you at baseline before therapy had higher gene signatures present for TH1 and TH17 populations, and that was, that, that was a sign. And that in addition, that, that in people who had treatment failure, those populations weren't suppressed. So higher baseline and a resistance to suppression by the therapy indicated poor, th poor results. So generally speaking, if the therapy works, you have a suppression of TH2 and TH1 signatures, not T help fo follicular signatures. But if you fail, you have higher TH1 and TH17 populations and expression in those genes of all the inflammatory programs that go with it and they weren't suppressed by the therapy. What was really interesting though, and they put this at the very end, like drop, they kind of drop the controversy and like the last figure and then walk away, <clears throat> which, you know, I respect here, is they don't see a change in Tregs at all with therapy. It's not beneficial or predictive. What? Yeah, your Tregs did nothing, Brenda. Your Tregs did nothing. I refuse this. to believe that. So they said this was controversial. They kind of acknowledge it. They don't deep dive it into it anymore other than saying that Treg phenotypes are not significantly modulated by the therapy. There's been some studies that said, suggested a favorable outcome 
they looked at in the CD137 positive, which is a marker of cells that go Tregs. They saw um, slightly increased IL-10 in the buildup phase. It wasn't sustained later on, and that there are no changes in FOXP3 or IL-10. They it just didn't happen, and they looked. And it wasn't right. modulated by the therapy. So Tregs did nothing. It was the ability of the therapy to suppress the Th1 and Th17, which was in part predicted by how high of a dial you had on those in the beginning. So if you're too high set at baseline, yeah. this won't work. How, how What was the success rate of this therapy? Um, I have to pull that. It was only 12. So presumably it was... Uh, because oh, they compare yeah, between they, successful and unsuccessful. Yes, right, right. So maybe 50-50, but they don't, they don't give me the, I'm looking for the, I have the clinical groups. They don't give me the end for each that I can easily find to tell you. Um, and when it comes to mechanisms, so they just say we see a reduction on TH1, TH2, and yeah. we see uh, increasing follicular health. The, the follicular is unchanged. Uh, unchanged. So they don't really explain where who is driving this 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 reduction th1 th2 correct they they just okay. show that it drops yeah they don't give me a great n on the patient group here and it's not in the it's just a magic antigen fairy that just fixes it yes the antigen fairy comes around i did like that the fact that they show there's clonal expansion i think that was mm -hmm. really important that like and it's they converged across people yeah so they converge across people to a less th1 th2 phenotype well and see. that the t-cell receptors converge okay yeah they're recognizing this the same thing which makes sense yeah, but it's interesting are end. they recognizing different parts maybe do you have some population it's, it's like a restricted group so it's not like one epitope but like they see a restriction in epitopes all shifting mm -hmm. towards very similar epitopes because you're giving them all the same antigen right but that doesn't mean that they're not Responding to the, that antigen with the pathological response is not against that antigen. It, it it just doesn't work. They don't see a difference in the clonality between responders and non-responders. So they they see the same thing. Oh, it's all groups. So like people who respond okay. and don't respond are still having T cell receptor clonality convergence, but they're not seeing mm. that they're not seeing that the number of cells drop. Okay, so they they're recognizing the same rough thing, and but then responders are having one phenotype, and non-responders are having. And a it's different based one. on your baseline. It looks like. All right, again, tone. you know, like unforeseen consequences of of serendipitous uh, immunological situations. That's great. There we go. Yeah, I can't get you the end. It's driving me nuts. I'm I'm gonna yeah I'm upset because that's very cool. I would I, I would 50, like to know 50, how efficient. There's only twelve donors. 50-50 and... 50 50 is pretty good in clinical medicine. I mean, that would be awesome, but I don't know. I, I wonder if they if they selected six and six. Maybe. Regardless. They don't even, they don't of... even give us that. I looked at them. They're like, which populations? There's no there's no table of the ed. All right. Maybe okay. Buried in the supplemental somewhere that's not published yet. Okay. Easy Together to with the conflict of interest for setting this. Uh, they uh, do have significant conflicts of interest with various pharmaceutical groups that they work with and own. In any case, I if that helps people eat peanut butter, I think it's it's a worthwhile it's my uh, breakfast every endeavor. Day. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, so I think that's great. Uh, let's just move to the last uh, favor of the day, and we're moving away from peanuts into ticks. Yeah, that's not really related. That's a terrible segue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> peanut tick, tick peanut. Um, so this this paper, I thought it was really nice uh, to check out. Uh, it's titled MRNA Vaccination Uses Tick Resistance and Prevents Transmission of the Lyme Disease Agent in Science Translational Medicine uh, from the lab of Errol Fickrick at Yale University. Three first authors. And it it's addressing the fact that tick tick-borne diseases are getting more and more common, uh, especially in North America and Europe. And I think a lot of people are uh, familiar with, for example, Lyme disease, which is transmitted by, uh, by Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, that is transmitted by the tick. And 
the question is whether we can help people uh, acquire some type of immunity against this disease, which can be very devastating. And the, the angle that they're looking at is not generating immunity necessarily against the parasite, but against the vector, against the tick biting and transmitting this uh, parasite to you. And so they start with, uh, with uh, recognizing that often exposure, ex repeat exposure to ticks generates some level of acquired resistance, uh, both in animals such as guinea pigs, and apparently also in humans to some extent. And what they should see is that uh, when you have this acquired resistance, there's a recruitment of inflammatory cells around the, the tick bite site. And that prevents, kind of blocks uh, feeding from the tick because the inflammation is like this type of this really, uh, uh, um, really strong inflammation. And that uh, reduces tick uh, feeding and prevents like inter inch exchange of things from the tick into your bloodstream, for example, the, 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 the uh, Borrelia parasite. Um, and so they started also discussing the fact that there's a difference between animals that are natural reservoirs of the tick, which is, for example, the mice, and animals that are not natural reservoirs, but can also be infected such as a guinea pig and ourselves as humans. Um, and show that animals that are not natural reservoirs can generate this acquired resistance much better than animals that are reservoirs. And apparently immunity to ticks in mice is almost impossible to achieve. So they look into, so when they look, they think about the tick bites and the fact that the tick injects this saliva that has all these proteins that uh, allow it to, to suck your blood. And they look at all these proteins of this uh, xylome, which is how you call the kind of the study of the, of the uh, stuff inside the saliva. And they identify also from, from literature, 19 uh, proteins that are encoded in this saliva and they, um, they are present in saliva and they generate lipid nanoparticles containing mRNA coding for all of these uh, proteins. So I think it's really cool because now with all the mRNA, with the advent of mRNA vaccination, people are trying to see the, the, the extents of this technology. So they make these lipoparticles that are, have this mRNA against 19, well, encoding for 19 different and potentially antigenic uh, proteins, and then they treat they treat guinea pigs guinea pigs with this, and what they see is that uh, they can in fact on the one hand uh, induce an antibody response against uh, most of these nineteen um, antigens. Uh, they find them so they find antibodies in the in the in the blood of these uh, guinea pigs, and then also they show that. They, there's substantial inflammatory response on the site of tick bites in guinea pigs that impacts the, the feeding of ticks. And this results in ticks that don't feed, that they detach or they die within 40 hours, 48 hours after the challenge. And so they show that you can indeed induce a kind of resistance by this using this vaccination. And they show that this doesn't work on mice. So mice do not mount an immune response, uh, but they, they kind of suggest that this should work in humans because humans are not natural reservoirs of the tick, of the of, uh, um, um, hosts. Yeah, it doesn't hosts. reproduce in humans. And what they also see, which I think is very important, is they see that, again, they can pretty much prevent uh, infection with, uh, with uh, the, the B. burgdorferi uh, parasite in all these guinea pigs, if they infect them with, with ticks and they removed after a short exposure, they remove the ticks, kind of mimicking what a human would do after being bitten by a tick, usually you see it and you remove it. And in this case, they could basically prevent infection with the Lyme disease uh, agent from all these guinea pigs. So I thought it was really cool because it shows a different application of the mRNA technology for vaccination. I think we're going to see more and more of this uh, as, as time goes by, given that now it should probably be a lot easier to approve this type of vaccine. And yeah, so they basically now cure guinea pigs of, of Lyme disease. Isn't that great?
This is awesome. I live in tick land. I don't know if you have a tick problem where you are, but I live in a land where the deer frolic in my backyard. Mm. And I'm just remorseful that my neighbors live slightly too close for me to hunt them. I have to go to the park next door. But yeah, I I I, I hate ticks. I have to pull them off my children once in a while. We have to check mm. every time they come inside to make sure we don't have a rash. My dad got Lyme disease a year ago and I had to write him doxy. Oh, um, no. Yeah. So I would like there to not be ticks. So this is awesome. Okay. So would you, would you take a vaccine against um, mRNA vaccines? Against I love, ticks? Yes. They're awful. They would probably, it would probably result in you getting a really strong reaction when a tick bites you, you will probably have a really bad time, but then you won't get Lyme. I agree with that. All right, then. Well, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Kiki Fairfax at the University of Utah in just a moment. But before we get to that, explore scientific resources for your immunology research at the Stem Cell Technologies Immunology Learning Center. Choose from different research areas and find expert interviews, technical tips, educational webinars, instructional videos, and much more. Visit stemcell.com slash immunology hyphen research. Talking to us today is Kiki Fairfax. She's Associate Professor at the University of Utah. And she studies in her lab uh, immunopathology of maternal and early childhood infections. And she particularly has a very interesting schizomyosis model uh, to, to study maternal schizomyosis and the effect on offspring immune development. Uh, Kiki, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm happy thank to be here. Thank you for being here. So I'm a big worm guy just because I'm a gut guy. And I think hemoliths are really fascinating with how they modulate everything in the intestine. Um, so before we dive into all things worms, could you give a quick high-level overview both of what they, these pathogens are, hemoliths are, and kind of their high-level life cycle? Because I think a lot of people don't know that, and it'll be important for context. Yes. So uh, one really important thing, um, and this serves as really the core scientific principle underlying all the work in my lab um, is the, the theory of evolutionary co-adaptation. Um, and so uh, helmets have co-evolved as parasites since the time of jawed fishes uh, evolutionarily. Um, and so from the time that we see the appearance of adaptive immunity, um, adaptive immunity occurs under the pressure of having parasitic helmets um, in organisms. So this skews my entire scientific view to see all adaptive immunity as having been driven to some extent by this macrobiota, right? A lot of times people talk about the microbiota and that's what uh, is really popular right now, um, but there's also a macrobiota of eukaryotic parasites that we have co-evolved with. Um, and so I particularly study helmets um, and uh, the trematode parasite, uh, Schistosoma mansoni, um, which is a parasitic helminth um, that is endemic, mansoni is endemic to Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. Um, it infects over 250 million people a year. Um, so fairly high levels of disease burden. Um, it is particularly interesting because it requires an intermediate host to be infectious to mammals. Um, and so infected people, infected cows, particularly when you're talking about um, uh, some of the other schistosome species, um, excrete eggs in either the feces for uh, mansoni, um, and uh, bovis and, and japonicum, or in the urine for hematobium. Um, and then these eggs hatch in fresh water. Uh, what hatches out is called a myricidia, which is like a little larvae. Um, it has to infect a freshwater snail. Um, and then this is really critical. It undergoes hundreds of cycles of asexual reproduction inside of that snail before it's able to develop into cercari which are the larval stage that's infectious to mammals. Um, they then break out of the snail, um, are available in the fresh water, and uh, penetrate humans um, through the skin. Um, and then you get development into adult worms. Um, and those adult worms are gonna end up in the case of mansoni 
in the portal vasculature and in the mesenteric vasculature. And one of the characteristics, right, is that these parasites also lay, uh, produce eggs in yes. their mammal, on the mammal host. And uh, this has been associated epidemiologically with a reduced efficiency of vaccination in places where these diseases are endemic. What do we know about that? And how has that um, inspired your research? So one of the most striking uh, public health stats is that the relative efficacy of many early childhood vaccinations is significantly lower in helminth endemic countries. Um, from uh, an epidemiological standpoint, <clears throat> it's associated with both maternal infections and then um, offspring getting infections during early childhood, so under the, the age of five. Um, and so we've seen direct correlations with maternal schistosomiasis um, and maternal infections with a, a few other um, helminths, uh, such as some filarial worms, um, and reduced efficacy of measles vaccination, um, reduced efficacy of Hib vaccination, um, and reduced efficacy of BCG. Um, those are the, the three strongest uh, sets of data that we have um, from an epidemiological standpoint. Um, and so the driver for me almost eight years ago now was to develop a mouse model that would allow me to interrogate the role of type two immunity in this reduction and then understand mechanistically what is driving this reduction in the vaccine response uh, in the periphery. So can you explain a little bit behind like the, the aha or eureka moment or neatness, however you want to describe it, of the, of the model that you have? For people? Uh, yeah, so um, I use a, a model that has a dual reporter system for IL-4 production. Um, and so IL-4 is one of the cy cytokines that's uh, um, considered a, a bicystox cystronic um, regulatory mechanism. And so opening the IL-4 loci does not guarantee protein production and secretion. Um, and actually less than 50% of the cells that ever open the IL-4 loci will secrete protein. So we use um, a dual reporter where one allele reports opening the loci, um, and that's a GFP reporter. Um, and those cells will stay GFP positive um, long after they're originally activated, once the loci is open, um, that GFP positivity is maintained for many, many, many weeks. Um, and so it's a way to track Th2 memory cells, which are not are never actively secreting IL-4, but they've opened the loci. Um, and then the second allele is uh, a replacement cassette, and it's an assertion, insertion of human CD2 into exon two of IL-4. And so human CD2 is put on the surface of the cells if the cell is actively secreting IL-4. And that turnover is very uh, rapid, right? And has similar kinetics to what we believe actual IL-4 secretion is. Um, and so this allows us to do many things. One, if you have two copies of this KN2 allele, you don't have the ability to secrete IL-4 because both of your copies, both of your alleles are knock-ins. All you're gonna do is report IL-4 production. Um, so we often use heterozygotes, um, but we have the ability through a breeding scheme of using um, a heterozygote mother and then a KN2 homozygous father to actually have offspring in the same litter that are either IL-4 sufficient or IL-4 deficient, right? Um, and we've used that to, in, to interrogate a few things um, about the role of IL-4 in the, this reduced immunity to vaccination that, that we've described um, and recently published in, in February of this year. Um, and so one of the really big aha things was for many, many years, and even I had this hypothesis when I wrote the grant originally, um, the assumption was that offspring born to schistosome infected mothers or any helminth infected mother that induces a lot of IL-4 would actually make more IL-4. And that's not actually what happens at all. They're dramatically inhibited in their ability to secrete IL-4. Um, and that's both homeostatically and then following immunization with an alum adjuvanted uh, early childhood vaccine, we, we use tetanus diphtheria for that. Um, and so that first finding, I'll tell you, I didn't believe it at first. 
<laughs> um, uh, and, and like a good scientist, um, I, I made my lab uh, redo the staining many, many times, um, but it is very robust um, and has actually proved itself to be true now over multiple animal facilities uh, as I have moved in, in the course of doing this work. Um, and so it really stood, I think, the, the thinking that everybody in the field had as to how mechanistically this reduced vaccine efficacy is being modulated um, really on its head. Um, and so what we demonstrated was that they don't actually make more IL-4 and less interferon gamma, right? Which is, which is what everybody assumed. Um, they're homeostatically stunted in IL-4 and therefore then they have a dysregulation in the stromal lymphocyte axis in the periphery and then an inability to form a proper germinal center reaction and then have all of the downstream events that you would have to get protective immunity following immunization. Um, and that's all work that, that we published uh, in, in February in PLOS Pathogens. Um, where we've gone past that is that um, in the last figure in that paper, um, we had single cell RNA-seq that demonstrated that in all B cell clusters, so not just the germinal center cluster, but all of the follicular B cell clusters, there was a dramatic downregulation of cell cycle chains. Um, and then the transcription factor, EBF1, which is really important for B cell identity um, and is responsible for all of the important downstream B cell differentiation events that um, would have to occur in order to get memory or long lived plasma cells to form. Um, and so this really ticked in our head that this is likely not modulation happening solely in the periphery. Um, and so where we've taken this work and, and we're just wrapping this up um, to, to get submitted hopefully by January um, is, is actually to the bone marrow. Um, and um, my current third year graduate student who's leading this project now um, has been able to identify that uh, B cell hematopoiesis is dramatically reprogrammed um, from the earliest stages of progenitor lineage commitment, so pre-CLPs um, at the HSCs. Um, so we can see this down-regulation of EBF1 and a reduced capacity for pluripotency very early on in hematopoiesis. Um, and I don't want to spoil her paper, so I'm not going to tell you the mechanism we found for that, um, but it's very intriguing. And so now our... Um, <clears throat> The, the paradigm of all our work now going forward is really there are two different events that are dysregulated in offspring born to schistosome infected mothers. At the periphery, we do have this dysregulation of the lymphocyte stromal cell access. So as we published in this paper, follicular dendritic cells are reduced by over 50%. Um, INKT, homeostatic secretion, is dramatically reduced. Um, and so you know, FDCs, of course, don't have the same progenitor. They're not hematopoietic cells, right, um, as the INKTs or the B cells. So clearly there are two completely different processes at play. Um, and so moving forward, we're trying to determine what is cell intrinsic at this uh, hematopoietic progenitor stage of reprogramming versus what cell extrinsic and involved in uh, likely being driven by stromal cells in the periphery. I... I'm, I was very impressed from your from your paper, the, the ones that you have already published. And I think it's so fascinating to be able to find these mechanisms that are so relevant for, for what is a very important issue, why vaccination is different in different uh, regions, and how can we uh, find reasons for this that, that that goes beyond the well maybe it's just nutrition maybe it's just some you know the planets are aligning who cares but it's really interesting to to find the tools to go deeper and find these mechanisms it's, it's just really really fascinating and we're very excited to see uh the the full mechanism uh, that you i do have some i, I do have watched uh, one of your talks and I know that you found some metabolism uh, differences uh, that uh, in in in, uh, in 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 this this cells, and I think that's very very interesting. There's there's one more thing that we wanted to to ask you about that maybe it's not directly uh, related to your research, but one other, another uh, position that you hold at the University of Utah is 
Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And we were curious to hear uh, what, that, what that kind of work entails and what brought you to that position? What do you think uh, yeah, your, your contribution on this position is? Um, yeah, so I, you know, I went through all of my training. Um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Chicago. Um, and there were no faculty members in STEM that looked like me. Um, I did my PhD at Yale and there were no tenure track faculty members in STEM that looked like me. Um, the first, there was one male black faculty member in, in epidemiology, uh, Curtis, who was a fabulous mentor to me. Um, but the first time I saw a black woman in STEM, she actually had a non tenure track position. She was a lecturer at Yale. Um, and she ran a program that I taught in called STARS. Uh, which was targeted at underrepresented minorities who had been admitted to Yale, but had been identified to have a weak STEM background. Um, and the goal of the program was to get them up to speed to what they needed to succeed and, and hope that they would be able to be maintained in the STEM workforce by having this extra support early on in their freshman year. Um, and working in that program was, was very rewarding to me. Um, and I had most of my tutoring was was focused on minoritized individuals um, from the time I was a teenager. Um, my only jobs have ever been teaching. Uh, so uh, private tutoring um, and, and then, of course, I'm in academia now. Um, and so it's something I've always done. Um, but I think it wasn't really until I was ending graduate school when I realized how painful it was to me that I was not getting external feedback that my demographic was valued and wanted um, in, academic, in academia. Um, and so as a postdoc, I continued <coughs> to work in, in these programs uh, targeted at underrepresented minorities. And I made the decision very early on that um, that would be one of my legacies in science. Um, don't get me wrong, I think I'm an awesome immunologist uh, and I, I, love my, I love my work, um, but I don't want the next generation to keep stumbling through academia, not feeling like they belong, not feeling like they fit in and not getting the feedback that they can truly succeed and succeed into leadership positions. Um, and so when I moved my lab, I did so knowing I wanted to be enabled to be able to make transformational change. Um, and I, my chair, you know, is, is completely supportive of that. Um, and I have been enabled to develop quite a few programs, uh, three pipeline programs so far, um, that are designed to create lifelong mentors for underrepresented um, minorities. Um, that will allow them <clears throat> to compete on an equal playing field um, with the white men that, that make up the majority of academic leadership positions. Um, so strength and depth of mentor network is one of the largest predictors of success in academia, right? We all get jobs based on who we know, right? True for me too, right? I have an Ivy League pedigree, it's definitely helped me get jobs. Um, and so, that is a place in which even after 20 years of the NIH and other organizations trying to make targeted reforms to improve retention of minorities in STEM, um, the weak network still persists. And so my programs are really designed around um, overcoming that obstacle. Um, the other main thing is that, and this is true for my generation, um, we were often given the external feedback that we could succeed as long as we were white enough, right? Um, so the way in which we talk, the way in which we think, our hair, right? Um, when I was in college, there is no way you would see a black female faculty member in any department with natural hair. It just wouldn't happen. You had to straighten your hair. Um, or else you were not professional when you were giving a talk. 
That's right. that's quite intense. And I mean, I speaking from outside, I've never been in the American education system that feels extremely uh, oppressive. It is, and it's and it's not just it's not just academia, right? I'm not, I'm not saying this is an academic problem. This is, this is a, a US wide problem, right? In corporate America, you had to assimilate, right? Even if you look now in school systems, right? So elementary, middle school, you still have kids that are being told they can't wear their hair in, hair in braids. They can't wear dreadlocks. They can't have natural styles, right? Um, this is a very, the whitewashing of blackness in order to be seen as okay, um, is very pervasive, right? And my generation, we did it because we had to, right? It was made very clear to me that I wouldn't succeed otherwise. So I have a very generic American East Coast accent. You can't tell where I grew up. I grew up in Detroit. I don't talk like a Detroiter when I'm talking to other people professionally. Um, and, and so my goals are really to eliminate that because it is psychologically very oppressive to have to suppress your true self in order to succeed. Um, and so I seek to, to create an environment of true inclusion. Um, and so you can talk like you grew up in Boston or talk like you grew up in Philly or talk like you grew up in Detroit and it doesn't change the quality of your ideas. And you don't have to work on suppressing your language and your vernacular to be taken seriously. That's what I want my legacy to be in science. I want people to be able to dress exactly how they want to dress and how they're comfortable dressing and not thinking that people are thinking that I can't possibly be a scientist because of how I look. I need to do X in order to fit in that box. Um, and then most importantly, you know, a place where the values of different cultures are equally valued, right? Um, we are guilty in science of having a one size fit all model of success. Um, and that model has traditionally excluded particularly women um, and minority women um, who have very different visions of what success is and visions of what we want to achieve at various points in our life. Um, and that has been belittled and and made to see seem as you can't possibly succeed if you don't subscribe to that, right? I know so many women, and I this is my case too, um, who didn't feel like they could have children until they had a faculty position. Um, and many more who felt that they couldn't have children until they had gotten tenure, right? Um, and and this burden is is even heavier on minority women. Um, and so, you know, it's, I want to keep doing the science that I do and I love it. I love my job, right? I want to keep loving it. Um, but I can't in good conscience keep working in a system that I, I know has so much friction for people that look like me. Um, and so part of my role is, is one increasing, of course, um, minorities at the University of Utah in particular. Um, but it's also really one of, of radical culture change, um, which is uncomfortable, but it's necessary in order to take the burden of discomfort off of minority scientists, which is where it's traditionally been. So I wanted to follow up with the, maybe a hard question, maybe not in relation to why Utah in particular. So I think of <laughs> When I think, and, and Brenda may not know this as much, but being not from the United States, but when I think of, I, it could be double-edged, right? Like it could be a great place to make an impact because it's demographically not as diverse as some states, or it could be really hard because it's not demographically diverse as some states and it's a state school, presumably, right? So you want to be able to pull state people in, but you have a smaller pool of state candidates. So it, it's just a, it's a question of, or maybe it's really supportive and they really wanted to make an investment. But, but, but why Utah? So there are a lot of people here that are, are committed to, to radical change. I'm not gonna say it's uniform because that would be a lie. Um, and I don't think it's uniform at any institution. Um, but I have what I think right now are some very, very, very good allies 
um, and, and a financial institutional commitment um, to address this cause. Um, and even before I got here, there had been a lot of progress made um, uh, for the native community. Um, so there's been a, a program at the University of Utah for over five years now. Um, I think it's coming up on 10, it's 10 years, yeah. Uh, called NARI, the Native American Research uh, Internship, um, and has had great success with increasing the number of uh, Native identifying people in uh, graduate programs um, at the University of Utah. Um, and so I specifically, for the majority of my programs, have now taken that focus to the black population. And yes, Jason, you are correct. There aren't that many black people in Utah, uh, but there are some. Um, and one thing that's really striking is the 2020 census results. And so Utah was the fastest growing state. Again, um, we were just under getting another con congressional district. Uh, we, were, we were beat out for Texas in, in that total number, but, uh, 52% of our population growth came from minorities. Um, and so the, the face of Utah is, is changing. Um, some would say it's going back to what it used to be uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, but the, the face of Utah is, is changing. Um, and yes, I'm at a state school and there are some limitations to that. Um, sometimes it's a little painful, um, but there is a population here that does need to be served. Um, we also have one of the fastest growing biotech industries. Um, we have what's called silicone slopes. Um, and lots of companies are, are fleeing California uh, for Utah. Um, and then there's many more startup companies. So this is actually a really great place for STEM careers, um, not just in, in academia, um, but also in, in the biotech space. And so for me, I would say, why would you want to exclude minorities from the vast opportunity that's available here in Utah, driven solely by the growth in this sector? Um, so to me, it's a place to target resources um, because there's opportunities for good careers down the road, which at the end of the day is what I want. Right. I, I don't I think every scientist should be in academia, period, but I definitely don't think that every minority scientist should be in academia. And so if there is dramatic opportunity for good careers in, in biotech made available by the proximity here in Utah and the number of companies um, being developed, I, I don't want to lock individuals out of that. I actually think we this is the place to, to target the talent so that they can come here for graduate school, come here for postdoc, and then get a really good paying job. It is very inspiring to see uh, how enthusiastic you are about bringing this change and, and helping, uh, yeah, minorities. And I mean, in general, everyone, I think everyone benefits from everyone having equal opportunities and bringing their talent to the table. It's just, it's just a matter of common sense. Uh, we're running out of time, uh, but it's been a really, really great conversation with you. We usually, we like to end our show with a little quick question that is not science related. We already have some of that, but we were wondering uh, if you were not a scientist, what would you be? A chef. <laughs> that is brilliant. Any any recipes that, that are particularly <laughs> close to your heart? Um. So I do uh, a Mediterranean Caribbean fusion is, is really what I naturally make. Um, my family is from the British Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my husband's family is, is from Italy. Um, and so I make what I call a, a Caribbean tiramisu, uh, which has a whole lot of rum. <laughs> Uh, and also significantly more chocolate than is present in uh, traditional Italian tiramisu. Um, and that is one of my favorite desserts to make. But everything I make involves a lot of rum 
Um, and so when I do a whole pig for Christmas, there is a whole 24 hour brining period in, in alcohol after the <laughs> traditional salt brine. Um, it's very yummy. Does it work for it's turkey? Like, like for, Jason um, is looking for his recipes for Thanksgiving, aren't you, Jason? First of all, throw out the turkey. It's an inferior bird. Don't use it. <laughs> um, you use a duck. Okay? Yeah, I've done duck. I've done a, a turkey duck as well. Goose. Um, but yes, I do actually also do an alcohol brine for all uh, poultry as well. Well, very, very interesting. I mean, I would say that a chef is basically a scientist of the kitchen. So I do think you, you have cheated a little I've bit, cheated. but we'll let okay. it. Well, my other thing is, my <laughs> other thing is I'm also a photographer. Um, and so when I give up science, uh, I, I am not one of these scientists that will die at the bench. Um, I... I don't want to still be writing R01s when I'm 75. Um, so, so when I when I retire from science, um, I will have a small restaurant and I will will also be doing photography um, semi full time. But wonderful. again, photography is based in science, so we can't and, escape science. And you can take pictures of the food you make. Yeah, <laughs> I can. I can take pictures of the food I make. <laughs> And also, is there anything in this world that is not based in science in a nope. way or another? Not a thing. Not right? Okay. You can't escape it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It's been great. Good luck with your upcoming publication. We're looking forward to share that uh, on uh, social media when it comes up. So make sure to tag the podcast so we uh, find out as soon as possible. Have I a will. great evening and... We'll stay in touch. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time. <laughs>